think it was my first or second day in IT shadowing a tech that he was on the phone with another technician and he said, I forgot you guys are on the 10.0. And I thought, what the heck is a 10.0? What he's referring to is in this IP address, it's 10. Dot, and that's the 10. Dot. So he's actually referring to this IP address here. And that's one example of the jargon and lingo that I want to bring you guys, and that's why I bring it up so much. How we talk in the field isn't going to be something that you're going to learn in your book, so I want you guys to be able to recognize those things when you're talking nerd with each other and you're trying to fix something. You'll understand and be able to communicate. Now, these three examples here are local IP addresses. They're actually local IP address ranges. So this 10.0.0.0 .0 .0 .0 through 10, 255, 255, 255. And then 172.16.00 0 .0 through this. I remember the first time that I saw these. I think I was studying my A-plus about a decade ago, and I remember I had to memorize these ranges. Now, having a Rolodex of IP addresses in your head, that will come, and it's impressive when you do. But to get started and to actually do our job as technicians, we don't need to know these ranges. If I'm being honest, I can't rifle out these ranges. What I can tell you is this 10 dot, this 172.16, this 192.168, because our goal for this episode is to be able to identify, to be able to understand what we're looking at, and to be able to communicate when we need. So if we're working with NetOps or if we're working with a vendor or anything along those lines, we'll understand that lingo, we'll understand what they're telling us, we'll also be able to communicate it back using the same jargon. Before we go over all these, I want you guys to understand how IP addresses work. I want you to understand that there's external and internal, or LAN and WAN IP, and when we use them and where we see them. I'm going to give you guys an example of how we actually organize the business that I work for, and then we'll kind of apply these IP addresses. That way it'll stick a little better, and that way you'll understand them better for the company that you work for, or if you're about to work for a company, once they start telling you these IP address ranges, you'll have a better understanding of how they implement them. So in this diagram, we have our internet here, we have your home modem, and then we have all of your devices. So each of your devices will get these internal IPs that are in those ranges that we were just talking about, and no matter if they're hardline or if they're on Wi-Fi, they're going to get these internal IPs. These internal IPs can't be routed over the internet. If every single device's IP address were to route over the internet, we'd run out of IP addresses really quick. So if you notice, we have a group of four numbers. So one, two, three, and four. For IPv4, we have a range of 0000 to 255, 255, 255, 255. So to put this into reference, think about this like a bike lock. So if we were to go through every single number, I could change this zero to a one, and then I could change it to a two, all the way up to 255. And then once I reach 255, I could change this to a one, and then it would be 001, 255, and then I can change it to a two and so on and so on. So this is a lot of IP addresses, but if you think about all the devices in your house, so think about your cell phone, your laptop, your tablet, your Alexa, your smart TVs, the IP address range would fill up really quick. Think about everyone in the world trying to route. That's why we made external and internal IP addresses. The way that this works is every device in your home will get an IP address. They're all gonna be on the same network. That means that these three devices can talk to each other on an internal basis. But what if they wanna go out to the internet? So what if I go to my computer and I say bestbuy.com, how does it make it to the Best Buy server to get their web page and then bring it back when I can't use a local IP address? Well, the way that the process works is your computer can talk to your phone using these addresses. It sends the traffic from your computer to your modem. Once it hits your modem, it does something called NAT, N-A-T. What NAT's doing is it's translating your internal IP address to one external IP address. So if my computer here, so dot two, is trying to get out to the internet, it'll leave my computer, go to my modem, it'll do the NAT process, and then it converts this 192 address into my WAN IP address, my external IP address. So my 9143.160.103. Now, no matter if it's my computer, my smart TV, my cell phone, no matter which local IP address it is, once it hits my gateway, it uses one single WAN IP, fetch whatever website, gather whatever data, and then come back. So when the data comes back and it hits my gateway, it still has this IP address. It does some processes that identify that it's my computer and not my smart TV and not my phone. By default, when you get internet at your house, you'll get one WAN IP address. That doesn't mean that you can't get more. So for an extra fee, you can buy more WAN IP addresses. An actual example of this and why we would have multiple IP addresses. So it could be a variety of different reasons, but I feel this is a pretty good one so you guys can understand. So if all the computer's at my site, when the traffic leaves the internet, it goes to this 98771.4. And it leaves, and let's say it goes to a website. But let's say I have a security company. They come in and they install monitored security cameras. So what that means is they actually have a building of people that are watching the cameras. And if there's theft or anything that goes on, they can call the police. Well, they have to be able to have access to these cameras from the internet. So what I'll do, I'll get a second WAN IP address from my provider. And you can buy these in singles or you can buy them in blocks normally. So a block is normally five of them and it's an extra cost every month. So for this example, I bought the 987713. You can see that's really similar to my primary because it's gonna be through the same provider. And then I give that IP address to my security company. The security company is able to go through the internet, connect to this address, which will give them access to my building, to their server, and then to each one of their cameras so that they can monitor them. And that's just an example of why you might buy a block of IP addresses. So now that we understand that we have internal IP addresses or LAN IP addresses and WAN IP addresses or external IP addresses, the goal is to be able to identify them and communicate with them. So this 10 dot range is an internal IP address. It cannot be routed over the internet. The same thing with this 172 range and this 192 range. Now this down here is just an example of thousands of WAN IP addresses that could be out there. I just picked two randomly so I could give you an example. So the goal is to be able to say, is it an internal or is it an external IP address? 
Now, as I had mentioned, when you first see these ranges, it can be a lot. Like, how am I ever going to memorize this? First certification test, yeah, you'll probably have to. But as far as doing our job, we want to be able to identify an internal IP address versus a WAN IP address. There's a couple more that we'll go over, but to simplify it, this is what I mean. This is really what you want to memorize or be able to identify. So you want to be able to identify the 10 dot. You want to be able to identify the 172 or the 192 versus these WAN IP addresses. Now, to give you an idea of where we'd actually use these, what this represents is there's actually two circuits going from the internet here into my building. So this is the primary connection, my primary circuit. Everyone that works for our company uses this fiber. We actually use Comcast to bring in our fiber. And everyone that actually works inside of our company, so the people we trust, the devices that we trust, the devices that we're monitoring, that we know are safe, all use this internal circuit. Completely separate company, Spectrum, brings in another physical line from outside and they connect it to our building. So now we have two circuits that come into our building. And one of the reasons that we do this is security. It's not that we don't trust every single person that comes inside of our company or every single device that comes inside of the company. We just don't know that it hasn't been hacked before it even made it inside of the company. So it might not be their intention to bring a virus onto the network, but unknowingly it could already be on their phone or on their laptop. So our visitors, our customers, our vendors, we all put them on this circuit here. Now, of course, there are other layers of security, but this is just one. So our broadband cannot talk to our fiber at all. So there's no way for our broadband or our external users to infect our internal network. Now, another reason we have these two circuits, all of my internal users are using this circuit to get onto the internet or to do their jobs. But what if this circuit goes down? What if a truck hits a pole down the street and it takes down the Comcast fiber? My network is programmed to flip over to the broadband circuit and start using that. Still, there's security in place to make sure that that traffic doesn't mix with the externals, but that's one of the reasons that we use it. Because remember, these are two physical lines. These are two separate companies that are actually bringing circuits into our building. So for the upcoming examples, remember that our primary or our fiber is using this 10 dot. And then our secondary or our external customers are using this broadband, this 192. So for this example, let's say I have one computer that's hooked up here. It's getting out through the 10.267.140. So that's my Comcast fiber. That's my primary circuit. So it's leaving through my primary. Now, for example, let's say I install a new computer and I plug it into another port. But now all of a sudden I can't reach our printers. I can't reach our servers. I can't reach our internal network. And when I look up the IP address, I'm getting the 192.168. So right away, I know the issue. I'm going out my secondary connection. So what I can do is I can communicate this by calling up my NetOps team and say, hey, I just installed a computer and I'm getting a 192 address. Right away, they're going to know that you should be on the primary on the 10.0. They're going to make their changes on their side, which will allow me to start going out the 10.227. And that's why it's important to be able to identify and communicate these IP addresses. So what to take out of this is that I can program groups of ports or ports individually to be able to go out my primary or to be able to go out my secondary. Secondary. So the reason I bring that up is if I'm able to identify the problem already, an easier way to try to solve the problem other than calling up your NetOps team, having them dial into the switch, make the change so that's fixed, you may just try unplugging this port and then plugging it into another port. That port can be programmed to be able to go out the primary and you've solved the issue already. All right, so I just want to start this example off and say that routing is extremely impressive. And I get it that most people that go into IT want to be cybersecurity and they want to be systems. I wanted to be systems when I went in. I fell into networking once I figured out what it could do and how much fun it can be. I love the logical side of it. I love troubleshooting it and figuring it out. So this example definitely fits into the build that we we were just talking about, but I wanted to go over it. So right here we have our access point, we have our internal laptop, let's say my laptop, and then we have a customer that walks in. Now I know we talked about how we can program each one of these ports to either go to the primary or the secondary circuit, but with routing, I can actually program one of these ports to do both. So here's an example of it. So I have one port and it goes to my access point that's mounted up in the ceiling. And on this access point, I have an internal Wi-Fi, and that allows me to connect my internal laptop to the Wi-Fi. The cool thing is with the same exact wire on the same exact port and with the same exact access point, I can program this to do both. So I only have one access point in the ceiling, but it's broadcasting both my internal and my customer Wi-Fi. So if a customer walks into my site, we're both connected to the same hardware, but we're going out two separate connections to two separate circuits, which is still keeping my site secure. And this is what you see in almost every single business. We're not running multiple access points. We're not connecting two separate connections. Now there are access points that you can connect two separate connections, but most companies don't use them. So you have one port, one access point, it's broadcasting two separate SSIDs. It allows my customer to connect and it allows me to connect and it keeps that security. So to give you an example of why we might use the secondary circuit inside of our building, we have these kiosks inside of our building. It allows a customer to walk up and customize whatever they're buying. Now, obviously, I don't want someone that's external or a customer to be on the same network as my internal for security reasons, but also we buy these kiosks from a third-party vendor. So if it was on my internal network, not only would I have to make sure that these kiosks are always up to date because of security, another angle is that it could get flagged by my firewall. If their software is using a certain port that I don't allow or a certain process that I don't allow, and it doesn't mean that the software is malicious. It just means that it's being flagged by my firewall. So it seems like a really big headache to keep them updated and trust their software. So a good option is to just plug them into a port program that port to go out my secondary, and that means that they're on a wide open circuit. What it means to use that term wide open, it means that it's not going through a firewall. It means that we're not blocking any ports or any protocols, and if the software or the hardware is having an issue, it's not being caused by our firewall. That's something that a third party vendor will commonly blame. It's really common that they'll come back and say that your firewall is blocking something. But then you can just respond and say, you're on a wide open circuit, we're not blocking anything, and it should work fine. Okay, two more IP addresses before I let you go. I want you to be able to identify these. This first one here, this 127001, this is a loopback address. This is a network address that you can use for testing. I'll let you do your own research on this. I won't bore you too much on this one. 
But it's a good one to know. So if you can identify it, when you see that 127, you know that's a loopback. Or if you're talking nerd jargon in the office, you can identify it. This 169 is a really important one, actually. So if you were to plug in a computer or if you were to boot up your laptop and get it on the Wi-Fi, the first thing that the device is going to do is it's going to reach out and try to grab an IP address. And there has to be something on the other end to give it that IP address. So at your house, at your modem. So when you put your laptop on your home Wi-Fi, it reaches out to your modem and says, can I have an IP address? Your modem says, yes, here's an IP address. And that puts your device on the network. Now, if you successfully connect to the network, so for instance, if you set up a new computer in an office building and you plugged it in and the other end was plugged into the switch, but it wasn't handing out any IP addresses, this is the IP that you would see. So if you called me up and you said, I plugged the computer in, I have a link light, but for some reason, I'm not getting out to the internet. And I said, what IP are you getting? You said a 169. I would know that it's reaching out to get an address, but it's just not getting a response. Now, if you plug the computer in and it wasn't patched in the server room, then you wouldn't get an IP address at all. You wouldn't get a link light and you get a red X over your connection symbol down by your clock. So when we're looking at all these IP addresses, right now what we're trying to understand is we don't need to memorize these ranges just yet. So again, if you're doing a certification, you do. But for what we're trying to learn, we want to know how to identify and communicate these. So these are our internal IP addresses. These are two examples out of a lot of WAN IP addresses or externals. This is your loopback. And then this is the IP address you'll get if you're plugged into your system and it has somewhere to reach out to, but it's not getting a response. For now, that's it on identifying and communicating IP addresses. And let's get ready for episode six.